I'm a renegade to the left is where I'm heading. I do rebel, I get big with no sweat. It comes natural, and I'm used to it. God, it produces it, so I can lose to it. And I'm growing and growing. As Third Eye was continuing the Who's the Man soundtrack and different things, um, what then was going on to where you got with uh, PMD and weren't doing as much with Bad Boy? What happened? Well, I started having, I don't really remember what it was, but it was just like slowly and progressively, I started feeling like I didn't want to, I didn't want to work with Puffy anymore. Um, And it was a combination of a lot of things. Uh, And it was also, you know, far as, far as me, far as I'm concerned, I didn't, I didn't, I was too much of a pure artist. I didn't understand business. You know, I didn't understand the things that he was trying to do, you know, where he was trying to go, the the model that, you know, how he was just, hey, how he was about to revolutionize the whole industry. You know, I didn't, to me, he wasn't hip hop. And I didn't like how he wanted to have his stamp on everything, you know. It was definitely an emotional decision. It was not a, it wasn't a business decision. You know, I learned later on, you should make business decisions. We all know that, especially based on emotions. So it wasn't a great business decision. It was more, it was just more ego and emotional. Like, yo, I need to get away from this dude. You know, it, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint what it was. It was something in my soul that was telling me this is not where you should be. You know, you should be somewhere else. And um, I didn't know where I was going, but I had already had a relationship with Das Effects. And um, they didn't know what was going on with me business-wise. They just called me one day and was like, yo, you know, we get ready to start this hit squad tour. You want to come? And uh, and so I was like, bet. And I went. And then that's how I met Parrish. And I met, um, you know, Eric Sermon. And... Um, by us being out on tour and I was letting him hear my demo. That's how Craig Mack heard everything. Craig Mack was the roadie. So when I went out on that tour, that's when I met Craig Mack. And, uh, you know, when we was going to city to city, when we would be on the tour bus, we was always blasting my demo, my third eye demo. And, uh, you know, Craig Mack would be there, but we, you know, uh, uh, K Solo, uh, Red Man was there, you know, and everybody was just like, Yo, you you the next shit, you know, and the only person that really was like it was just Red Man. <laughs> Red Man, Red Man was the only one that whenever we would bump into each other, and it would just be me and him, man. He would be telling me, Yo, I bust your ass. He said, Yeah, I know everybody talking about you, but I bust your ass. And it, it would it would throw me off. I was like, yo, because I didn't hear much of him because he was out on tour, he just was on the headbanger. That was really all that I had heard of him at the time because his album hadn't dropped yet, you know. Um, so it did. It wasn't like I was leery of him or anything. I still thought that he couldn't fuck with me, but it still was like it was like Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston. You know, like Sonny Liston was like, "I'm gonna beat the shit out of this dude," but still being thrown off by him going, "Yo, you ain't shit." You know, my Muhammad Ali thought, "I'm gonna just bust your ass." You going down in five, you know. And, and I know that rattled Liston, you know, even though Liston at first, before the first fight, probably still thought he was just going to break his ass up. He still was like, but what's up with this dude? That's how it was with, with Red Man. I was like, damn, yo, damn. I was like, yo, this dude ain't no joke, man. You know, because he wouldn't, you know, he was still always cool, but it would just be little times. Like we might be in a hotel and I go to the ice machine and I turn the corner and it's just me and him. And he's like, yo, what's up? You good? You good? Where you at? You on the second floor? And I was like, yeah, I was on the second floor. He's like, yo, you got some bitches down there? I was like, yeah, I got a couple of girls down there. He's like, yeah, I might come down there, man. He said, yo, 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 your songs is dope, man. You know, but I'll bust your ass. <laughs> I was like, I said, yo, this dude is crazy. And I'll be like, yo, all right, I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. I always, I always, that's why I, I always love to see that brother, man. The red man ain't no joke, boy. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of Headbanger, you sampled that on the No Shorts, No Sleep from PMD. And that beat also is a, a lot more skeletal. Doesn't have as much music going on than a lot of the stuff you had done up to that point. Do you remember why uh, that beat was a little more stripped down? 
he didn't want to clear samples. You know, so he, you know, he, he, he didn't want samples. That was his thing. He was like, yo, leave the samples alone. That's why, it, it, so most of the stuff is stuff that I play. I figured he wouldn't have a problem with his own record being sampled in there. You know, even though there's a, uh, at the beginning, um, there's a little short sample of Ro Rush, uh, Roland Kirk, Rashad Roland Kirk, the jazz musician, him talking, uh, he said, so I forgot, I forget what he says at the beginning, but, um, yeah, other than that, he didn't want no samples, so that's why that song went like that. Okay. Know? And then how how did uh, the connection with you and Nine come about? Because at first, I actually thought that might have been you because the way his voice was and the style a little bit. I was like, man, is that? And then I was trying to, like, figure out who Third Eye was compared to you versus all this. And then Nine came, and I was like, wait, is this this? Like, so how did that all happen? Um. I grew up with Nine. You no, know, Nine. I went to high school with Nine. Um, nine actually was the first one to get me into making records when I was like about. I mean, I had already been making demos, but, you know, he introduced the first person that I met that was in the industry was Chuck Chilla. And Nine introduced me to Chuck Chilla. Chuck Chillout introduced me to Vincent Davis, who had a record label called Vintertainment Records, which put out the Joe Ski Love and then later Keep Sweat. So I was signed to Vintertainment before Joe Ski Love, before Keep Sweat. And uh, that came about, you know, as a domino effect through Nine. Because Nine had a record out called Bogus Beats back in 1985. You know what I'm saying? Him and, him and uh, uh, you know, rest in peace, a friend of ours named Tito, who passed away a couple of years ago. They had a group called uh, Deuces is Deaf um, or Deuces is Wild, something like that. And they had a record out called Bogus Beats. And um, I had known him from high school and I ran into him one day and he was like, yo, I got a record out and show me the record. And I had a cassette, he let me hear it. And I was amazed, like, because, you know, you, you have an actual record, man, you know. And, um, yo, can you hook me up? How'd you, you know, how'd you do this? And... Whatever it was he told me, he introduced me to Chuck Chilla. And um, I had Chuck Chilla's number and I called Chuck Chilla. And Chuck Chilla was like, yo, I know this dude. He's a young dude. He's, he's just starting out with a label. You know, he lives on Laconia Avenue, or, you know, in our neighborhood. His name is Vincent. And, um, you know, I told him about you and he's interested. And that's how I met Vincent. And by me meeting Vincent, and having those demos with Vincent, that's how I met DST. By me meeting DST, that's how I met Gordon Williams. And, you know, it's, it's a domino effect. It, but but it started with nine, you know. Hmm. So we, we got together. And, uh, you know, we, we've always been friends. And I've always had a, a tremendous amount of respect for him as an MC. You know, he was always dope, always. Even in high school, he was always dope. You know, I would think that I was the best in the neighborhood until I heard him, you know, and I, will, I would always be like, this fucking dude, man, where, what the fuck, man? Where is he getting this shit from? You know, but it, but it, but it, it drove me. It, it drove me because whenever I would hear him, it would make me go home and, and write harder, you know? And, I, and I, I never, I never wanted to go against him. You know, it, it, it kind of motivated me to more, be with him, you know, because it, it, it was that respect. It never was like, yo, I know I'm better than him. It was always like, yo, I need to get to know this brother more, man, because he's dope, you know. And uh, right. so we been music. I just, I just did something with him recently, maybe about, about a month ago. You know, oh, wow. I did a song on the, uh, on the album he's working on, and he's still dope. He's still dope to this day. Nice. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then, with the Karis One. Uh, Step Into a World, one of his biggest songs as a solo artist after Boogie Down Productions. Um, lots of questions. First of all, how and why, since sampling was becoming an issue or had been an issue for a while, and Blondie Rapture, that's not going to be like, oh yeah, we can just do that one. How, how and why did you guys end up using that? Well, the girl that's singing it, her name is Kiva. When after I laid down the track, she she showed up at the studio. It was KRS 
you know, he had the idea. He wanted some singing on it. So he said, listen, Wes, she's going to go in the booth. And she's going to sing. And he said, if you hear anything that you like, you know, let me know. And he left. Or oh, he was in the lobby or something. So it was just she and I in the studio. And she just kept singing different things, you know. I was, you know, and I would say, that was okay. Try something else. And so she got to Rapture. She came up, she got to Rapture, and she sang it. I said, whoa, wait a minute. I stopped the tape. I said, that's it right there. That's it. That's it. She said, that's it? I said, yeah, give me a second. So I took a pen and paper, and I wrote, you know, what she's saying to step into a world. I don't even remember, but I wrote the whole And I wrote it and gave it to her, and she sang it. And then after she sang it, then I went and got Chris. It was like, come here, man, listen to what we got. And uh, we played it, and he listened to it, and he looked and said, yes, Jesse West, yes. That's it right there. You know, that I said, okay, I think this is a hit record, but what's going to happen when Blondie hears this, right? And, and um, Jeff Finster was the... Uh, had a and at Jive Records at the time. He was there, you know, he was ecstatic when he heard it. And he said, let me handle that, you know, let me handle it. And um, I think at first she wanted all the publishing. And me, honestly, when he called and told me that she wanted all the publishing, I said, without her, man, it ain't, it ain't a record, man, without her, man. So. I think you should give her all the publishing, you know. I, I said, you know, I I wasn't gonna get that much publishing anyway because the Mohawks, we gotta clear the Mohawks, you know, we gotta clear that. So it is what it is, man. You know, I'm doing a song for Kara. This is my thinking was, you know, my name, you know, my credit, it'll, 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 it'll pay itself off later on with the extra work that I'm gonna get. And this record is gonna go gold at least. I know that this is a gold record. And I want that gold record. So, you know, because he was calling me. He said, yo, she, she want to have all the publishing. And I said, I, I, I don't mind, man. You know, and he said, all right, I'll get back to you. And then he came back and then she didn't want, she ended up only getting, you know, half the publishing. So I said, that's even better. I said, but she's a business. <laughs> she understood when she heard it. She understood the assignment. And she said, well, I'm not selling for less than half. And she got half. She got she got half. That is my most successful record, period. Yeah, I was gonna say that one is a smash. <laughs> so it's how it's been, it's been how many years has it been? It's been 25 years since that record. And I make with my little bit of publishing on it, I make for 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 25 years, I make at least seven or eight thousand dollars a year off of that song you know and not in increments in one it's been used in like six movies it's been used in nba 2k i mean i got like twenty thousand for that that's just and 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 my little publishing so think about what blondie got if i got 20 grand look what blondie got for it you know for doing nothing and um it's been playing in between in the NBA finals right now. You know, it's been playing. It's been playing uh, take two, you know, after after Stephen Smith, A. Smith stopped talking and is giving to go to commercial. It plays, you know, so I'm 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 I'm, I'm very grateful for that. You know, uh, um, one of my friends was telling me, you know, she was like, yo, you how many of your peers could say that? their music is playing in between the NBA finals. Millions of people are watching this right now. And she said, it just happens to be a track that you produced, that you made, that's playing, you know, every final. Yeah. That's, 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 that's KRS one. You know, yeah, that, that's that every year, man, somebody's using it for something, man. It's be the licensing, the licensing every year. It's being licensed for something, and that's twenty five years straight, every single year. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, congratulations, man. That's huge, and that yeah. that uh, because to think of just from the no prisoners to step into a world is like such a huge change, and mm -hmm. uh, all the different things, 
and KRS One, of course, was out before you. <laughs> so it's just, it's just so crazy when I realized it, or when I first saw the credits and I saw you had done it back then when it was coming out. I was like, that's crazy. So yeah, yeah. even with the exhibit too, the what you see is what you get. You know that that was a, that's another song that uh is a classic. You know it it didn't do as well monetarily as a uh, as a uh, step into a world man but it's, it's still a classic man people always talk about it because especially because the video that he made for it was a was a game changer you know that video was incredible video and um those two those two songs what you see is what you get and 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 step into a world it's fitting that it's my most successful song because it's one of the songs that i had the most to do with you know like i had a lot to do with step in the world step into a world being the way it is like i said i i picked the sing rapture i wrote the hook step into a world and you know i wrote the hook i'm scratching doing the scratches what 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 and then i did the whole beat you know it was krs vision it was chris had the vision you know because when he when I played music for him, I played about 10 tracks for him. And when he picked that one, I was pissed off. You know, I was pissed off. I was like, yo, he picked the most simplest one, man. Like I, I was, I remember going home going, yo, what the fuck is wrong with these dudes, man? I played him all kind of shit, man. And he picks, you know, but I remember my boy was like, but he picked something, man. What the fuck is wrong with you? That's KRS one. He picked one of your beats. They could be happy. And I was like, yeah, but it, it ain't gonna, it ain't showcasing what I could do, you know? And because it was just four bars. It didn't have none of the breakdowns with the bam, 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 champ. It didn't have none of that in it. It was because of that attitude. See, everything works. It was because of me having an attitude like, damn, man, it ain't gonna show what I could really do. Maybe go, you know what? I'm gonna go home tonight and do more to it. Because right now it's just a four bar, four bar loop. So if I want to show what I'm really capable of doing, I got to do more. So let me go home and put some breaks in it, put some drum breaks. Let me let me play with it, you know, and that and it, it made it a lot better by mm -hmm. me doing it. And Chris is such a genius. When I came to the studio, I said, Chris, I did a whole lot of different shit to it, man. I put all kind of breakdowns in it, man. So I need to hear, you know, what you're going to say on it so I know where to put the breakdowns. And Chris said, put them where you feel like it. I said, okay, all right. I said, if that's what you want, all right. And I, that's what I did. But when you listen to the song, the breakdowns are like, it sounds like it was playing that way, you know? But yeah. he's showing up. I said, Chris, I need to know your, you know, the structure, structure of, you know, your, your, your rhyme. So I know where to put the breaks. He said, he said, put them where you feel like putting them. I said, I said okay. I want you to listen real close to me. I'm gonna ask you some real simple questions. And I want some real simple answers. Do you understand? Yeah. Do you understand? Yes, I, I understand. You said that you couldn't have possibly been at the crime scene at 11.15 because you went to the bookstore buying my audio book and my hardcover book at 11.15 when the crime scene occurred in Soren's book. The history of gangster rap. So you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying the books. Right, right. At 11.15, I was, I was at the bookstore at, at 11.15 and when, when I, bought, I bought the books and accidentally left them at the store. So at 11.15, you couldn't have been at the crime scene because you were buying books, right? At 11.15, I was, we, we was, when I was leaving, 
it was, it was some people coming in, and I, I, I forgot to grab. But them. you, you, you don't remember who what they look people, like. What would they look like or nothing? Right? No. Hmm. So. Twelve fifteen. You went to bookstore buying my audio book and hardcover book and Soren's book at twelve fifteen. So you couldn't have been at the scene because you were buying the books, right? Yeah, at twelve exactly at twelve at twelve fifteen exactly. I was at the bookstore. <laughs> You know you know fucked up. Which which one? First you said you were at the bookstore at eleven fifteen, and then you said you were twelve fifteen. You know you know fucked up. Man. He fucked up. Yeah, he fucked up. He fucked up. Man, you you confusing me, man. So you get my book, my audio book. 40 years in Soren's book, History of Gangster Rap, and if you don't, you know you're not fucked up, right? Man, the more those cops ask me questions, the more I wish I bought them motherfucking books. <laughs>